topic to get us started in today's Janus for our talk. My name is Steve Wolf. Uh, welcome, particularly to Janus Dickinson, who will be giving the talk today. Uh, I think it's great that, you know, they say something like, uh, probably you'll never get it right, but they say something like, uh, physics moves ahead with the death of each physicist. But we could say something more optimistic, which is that conservation might move ahead with the entry of each biologist. And so Janice's talk today really taking on questions uh, very much about, uh, in the department we often use the word policy very loosely, but really not to talk necessarily about biology, but to use her interest and knowledge of behavior and apply it to a uh, uh, socioeconomic question of individuals and behavior. Drawing on a range of literatures you see here, so I think that there's something for everyone in today's talk. I think none of those Oh no, we did get evolutionary biology first, because I'll, I'll be interested to see how that plays out. And I think that given the lineup this semester, that we just had a nice conversation with Bob Frank, and the, um, I'm embarrassed to say I forgot our graduate who gave the talk from Rare two weeks ago. I'm the only one. I'm the only one, thank you. Um, that this talk fits in quite nicely with those. So Janice had a long career at Berkeley, has come to us seven years ago. I get that about right? right. Primary appointment in the lab of ornithology with a split appointment in the Department of Natural Resources. A lot of interest in uh, uh, ecology, um, particularly neurobiology. Did I get that right? Behavioral ecology. Behavioral ecology, thank you. Um, and I think it's really interesting that Janice is someone who's really taken advantage of what tenure can offer and what a creative mind can offer. I know she has uh, written on really provocative stuff, and I will, again won't get the terminology right, but the idea that consumption behaviors and unsustainable behaviors could be understood through reference to recognition or our inability to recognize mortality and some kind of fear of death and a need to leave a mark in a really provocative way to think about how cognition and behavior and um, dysfunctional behaviors can emerge and could be understood. Today's talk taking a very different, but again, very creative approach with the idea of new technologies and social marketing and what they can offer and what we can learn. Janice is leading the program in citizen science at the Lab of Ornithology, which can cut a whole variety of ways, and I know she does in her own work and the team that she's leading over there. So thanks very much for being here. We're interested in what you have to say. Thank you, Steve. Uh, am I not liked here? I'm not, right? But you can hear me OK back. Excellent. So when Matt and Steve approached me to give a seminar this fall, I was really delighted because I haven't given a seminar here since my job seminar in 2005. And we discussed ideas and one of the ideas I put forth was that I talked about my primary research program on kin-based cooperation in western bluebirds where we have years and years of data and have followed some lineages for as many as 10, year, uh, ten generations. But we converged on a much more challenging problem that I could talk about, which is how we can support massively collective pro-environmental behaviors and shift social norms using the World Wide Web and social networking. So that's what I'll be talking about today. It's primarily an ideas talk. I do have one data slide. And this is essentially how I spent my sabbatical, is really trying to read the literatures in these different areas and bring together ideas to come up with pragmatic solutions for interventions that we can do to support collaborative pro-environmental behaviors. So I've been leading the citizen science program at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology since 2005. And that program brings together research and education to reach out to a large crowd of individuals to really contribute data on bird distribution abundance and uh, collect long-term data sets on birds. But I'm gonna turn from that now and take, ask what we can use these kind of crowdsourcing models based on the web to make it easier for people to support each other in the context of pro-environmental behavior. So I'll be talking about the proximate and the ultimate drivers of cooperation in this talk. And then I'll talk about how those have been applied to the design of the Yard Map Citizen Science Project that we're in the middle of developing. And then I'll talk again about how we can do experiments to really ask what kinds of interventions can help support pro-environmental behavior on the web. So crowdsourcing is a form of cooperation in 
in and of itself, but it has a centralized leadership. And so its structure is that basically that leadership prescribes what individuals should be doing and feeding back to the central organization. And then in exchange, the organization feeds back tools and resources that allow people, in the case of citizen science, to visualize their data within a larger context or even play with large data sets. Our projects at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology engage over 200,000 people annually, and we have about six or seven projects, I can't even keep count now, and they're all focused on birds, except this new one, yard map. There's been tremendous growth in citizen science as a form of crowdsourcing since the advent of the web, uh, and this culminated this year in a book on citizen science produced by the lab and Cornell University Press, and also a conference on public participation in science, scientific research that preceded the Ecological Society of America meeting in Portland, Oregon, Oregon, and in which Jennifer Shirk in our department played a key role. We see crowdsourcing in com commerce with threadless t-shirts, so where two young men in their homes developed a, a corporation that now is is quite large. They have 300,000 graphic designers offering potential designs. The modelists have their visitors vote on the t-shirts and then they can ma manufacture t-shirts in accordance with the popularity of those t-shirts and the market that they've already assessed. You've got crowd philanthropy, people putting up projects that need funding on the web and there are several crowdfunding sites and other people coming in, in this case, 17,000 people coming in and contributing financially to those projects. And you've got science, Citizen Science Online with Zooniverse, which arose out of Galaxy Zoo, where people went online to categorize galaxies. And now they're categorizing all kinds of things, and including sort of categorizing uh, 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 and archiving samples from cancer patients but also taking handwritten data which have been scanned and entering them into online databases to recover some of the important historic environmental data that we have. And then there's the game-like citizen science projects exemplified by Folded, which is a protein folding project. It's had 250,000 players to date. People go online, they're taught a set of rules for for folding proteins, they try lots of things, they compete with each other, they communicate with each other, and um, this project is responsible for discovering the tertiary structure of a regulatory protein for the prosimian AIDS virus. But my favorite are Make Magazine's Magazine and Instructables, which is shown here. For the scale that they're achieving, they were they were touted by the depth Deputy Director of Education as the most innovative and important science projects ever, and they have been funded by DARPA to get into the schools. What, what uh, Instructables allows people to do is show off their own inventions, their own creations, and it's got 4.3 million participants per month doing this. What you see here is a secret spy shoe and a fire-breathing pumpkin or jack-o'-lantern. And why is it so successful? I think we should all be asking that. Why, if they can get 4.3 million people a month submitting inventions, how could this kind of energy be harnessed to create, to generate new ideas for how we will interact with our environment, to generate new inventions re with regard energy consumption. And I think the reason it's so successful, and these are my hypotheses, is that it's identity building, it involves cool technology, it allows people to show off their inventions to each other and compare their work with that of other people. It allows them to communicate and also form small communities with like-minded people where they can share ideas. So, most citizen science projects to date, the type that I was talking to, talking about earlier, are really about bowling alone. You're out there on your own, you're, you've agreed to a set of rules, our participants give us what we want, and we give them stuff back. 
that stuff is usually evaluated from the point of view of education, but that's the basic model that we have. And I don't think we can compete with something that is profoundly social <coughs> and that allows people the opportunity for self-expression. I think the game changer in everything we do on the web is the social web. We've got Facebook with 125 billion friendships, 2 billion likes per day, and 526 million daily active users. That's a large crowd, and that's the kind of crowd you really need to get involved in conservation. And then you look at, now I'm not going to ask how many people have played this game, but you look at the social games in Facebook, Farmville, what is it? It's a little two-dimensional square of property that allows people to place three-dimensional objects that they are given or can select or even purchase on that. And it's not popular anymore, but it reached 80 million players. It's just amazing. We've got 46 million birders and 90 million gardeners in the U.S. Those are estimates. So how do we move people from something that looks like this to something that looks more like this, that actually has some relevance to our practices in daily life, to how we live in the world? So this is what I want to talk about today, is really how this socially networked form of crowdsourcing can help to generate massively collective environmental behaviors. In 2009, we got NSF funding to create a socially net networked ecological mapping tool, the Yard Map. And we got funded from informal science education because we were doing innovative research in Yard Map on social learning. And they were interested in that. Um, the topics around which people were learning were landscape ecology and the idea of ecological traps, the idea that people will move into residential landscapes potentially, that we really don't know whether improving those landscapes causes birds to move in there and then not reproduce successfully or actually improves the habitat for birds. And what's nice is that informal science education actually considers environmental behavior or any kind of behavior as a potential learning outcome. So our other focus was on conservation stewardship. Towards the end of preparing the proposal, we brought in four PIs because it, I realized that we had this project that we were going to develop that really had cross-disciplinary research potential. And the best thing to do would be to bring in people at the start who could see that potential and advise us on how to develop the project. We have a fantastic team developing yard map. Rhiannon Crane, who's the project leader, has a PhD in informal science learning from the Center for Informal Science Learning at, at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Robin Bailey is a snake ecologist. Chris Marks is an application developer, a Java programmer, among other things, and he actually has a background in agroecology from this department, and Kevin Ripka, who's our web designer. So what is Yard Map? Yard map allows people to go out and outline any site that you can find on the earth. So essentially, it can be a schoolyard, it can be a park, it can be a study area, it can be a residential uh, uh, parcel, such as you see here. And that's our main audience for the project. And once they've done that, they can go in and lay down polygons that represent different habitats. We're starting here with the impermeable surfaces, and then you're supposed to cover the entire outline with habitats, as we began to call them early on. After you've laid down the habitat types, you can go in and grab from another set of, uh, from another menu, a set of objects, and place those on the map. Those objects, ultimately, we would like to have be more freeform, so that individuals can create their own objects. But right now, we <coughs> offer a pretty good palette. And they put those objects on the map, um, and those can represent either behaviors or sustainable practices or plants, so, such as the trees that you saw going down a few minutes ago. There's supposed to be a solar roof panel that goes on the roof, but the application stopped. Not only that, every object in the map is clickable and discussable. So you can go in, 
and pull up a little window, it'll tell you what it is. People can add lots of information to their objects, and you can even open this window and see various categorizations, photos that have been uploaded, discuss identification, and have interchanges. What's important is the new version that we're launching, whenever you have an interchange over an object in a map, it's going to appear front and center in the, in the social network so that other people can see it. So it's fully public. And that's where the social networking piece can really be fostered. We also provide data out in the form of uh, characteristics of people's spaces, habitat overviews, site photos. And if they do eBird, their eBird identifications or the birds that they see get pulled into this, this tool as well. We are in beta testing at the moment with over 3,000 people trying out YardMap. And the new version launched this fall is going to also push very easily out to Facebook and allow people to see maps in Facebook and go right in back into the map. At the moment, we've already got people doing research with YardMap. There's a PhD student at Binghamton who is uh, creating lots and lots of hexagons for monitoring birds and associating occupancy with habitat. So <clears throat> now that you've seen the tool, I want to step back and talk a little bit about theoretical treatments of cooperation and how we're trying to refine this tool for both uh, uh, studying and implementing interventions that are going to support pro-environmental behavior. And that really begins with understanding the evolution of cooperation. So uh, in 1920, we first saw the popularization of game theory by von Neumann. And that directly preceded the, the uh, advent of the modern synthesis, where people went out, uh, where scientists began to um, merge the ideas of Darwin, natural selection, with the principles of inheritance and evolutionary biology just took off. We had Mancure Olson in 1965 who really, who wrote a book that clearly identified the problem of social dilemmas. Social dilemmas being the problem that um, you cooperate, that self-interest conflicts with group interest and that creates problems. He put forth the zero contribution thesis showing that you can't maximize group interest and self-interest at the same time and indicated at that time that we have a free rider problem that really prevents large scale cooperation. He focused a lot on group size and the idea that the cooperation is much more easy to achieve in small groups than in large groups. At the same time, we had W.D. Hamilton coming forward with kin selection theory, the idea that we pass on our genes not only through our direct descendants, our offspring, but also through collateral kin through our relatives. So if I help my sister produce an additional offspring over what she would be able to do without my help, I get credit for that weighted by my relatedness to that offspring. Everybody in natural resources knows Garrett Hardy, Hardin's work, The Tragedy of the Commons, which is an end person prisoner's dilemma. Again, a game theoretic model. And Bob Trivers's reciprocal altruism emerged in behavioral ecology in 72, and then Axelrod and Hamilton with the iterated prisoner's dilemma. And in all of these cases, they're assuming that we are selfish, rational egoists who only behave in our own short-term self-interest, short-term for the most part. So the prisoner's dilemma as the root of all this really demonstrated in an elegant way, starting in 1950, that the, when you have this conflict between cooperation and, and uh, non-cooperation, that it always pays to defect. The problem is, we aren't rational egoists, and we know that. We, our potential for cooperation is much greater in behavioral games that are based on these models than is predicted. Um, we are incredibly capable of detecting altruists and cheaters. We spread pe 
people's reputations through gossip. We're incredibly, we're hyper-social beings. We engage in ostracism. We are even wired, we uh, recently discovered, wired to respond to ostracism, not only with emotional pain, but when people are ostracized, the air, the, they show activity in their brains associated with feeling physical pain. So um, we have a, a intrinsic neurological rewards when we express generosity. And uh, we pay a lot of attention to social norms, including the norms of reciprocity. If I give you a gift at the holiday and you don't give me one, you feel a little bad about that. So this is not news to any of the social scientists in the room. And in a way, when you think about it, it just blows your mind that evolutionary biologists went along like this for years and years and years. <laughs> say, say, you know, basically with these models, even though there was growth of mathematical modeling expertise with these models that pay no attention to what we are as a species. So you've got, and these are really spotty, so don't mind me, social scientists. I put my favorites in here. You can pile lots and lots of folks' names in here. But we had Durkheim in 1873, who was concerned with anomie and the breakdown of social norms and what that meant for our ability to cooperate. Um, we had Irving Goffman in the 50s talking about the fact that we're actors in, in the social world and we're incredibly concerned by by the impressions that we make to others. Um, we had Ernest Becker who took that further saying basically we don't even really have a self. We, we fashion a self and we derive self-esteem and group identity and meaning out of, um, out of being part of a group and sharing a worldview with others and, and being antagonistic towards our groups to bolster that worldview. We had more reasonable approaches like the theory of reason to action and theory of planned behavior that actually are more pragmatic and trying to get at how social norms influence people's behavior. And then, you know, all along the way, we're, we're hearing that people strive to form positive social identities as group members. So this needs to be taken into consideration when we're talking about both the evolution of cooperation and also the proximate mechanisms that we use to achieve cooperation. So it wasn't really until the 1990s that evolutionary biologists began to really incorporate the social nature of human beings into their mathematical models with two key types of models. Indirect reciprocity. So what is indirect reciprocity? It means that it's not just you and me trading off. It's that if I watch Steve being generous to Angela, then I'm more likely to be generous to Steve or to cooperate with Steve. Or it could be that, um, that I cooperate with Steve and then that makes Steve more likely to be generous to Angela. And those models are capable of sustaining cooperation. <coughs> There are also public goods games, and public goods games are more likely to sustain cooperation if you include opportunities for both social rewards, so you get rewarded for being cooperative, and social punishments, you're punished for being non-cooperative. So finally, in the 1990s, we started having the evolutionary biologists on board with what the social scientists have known all along. And, um, and that leads to some, I think, some very fruitful ground for understanding social dilemmas and how social dilemmas might be resolved in some very important contexts. So I'm going to talk about <coughs> these, talk about the kinds of questions we're asking and the interventions we might do in terms of both ultimate explanations, which in behavioral ecology, this is really applied behavioral ecology. And behavioral ecology is, is really the evolutionary explanation. Um, and that is here that natural selection favors interdependence among non-kin due to the fitness benefits of cooperation for individuals living in groups. And this goes back to um, the idea that we evolved as collective problem solvers, that the group was needed to do the heavy lifting. So Sarah Blacker-Purdy's ideas 
that we really had a very hard life as ancestral human beings, or, or, or uh, yeah, as ancestral human beings, and we, um, we needed each other to even survive. So we call that the hard life hypothesis. Proximate mechanisms are the various mechanisms that allow us to cooperate. And then we're adding to this social networking theory. So how social networking theory has several implications for cooperation. The first and most important one is it gets around some of the constraints of group size when you're asking questions about massive collaboration or massive cooperation because <coughs> Within social networks, homophilous individuals, individuals with similar ideas, tend to group up. They tend to have stronger ties with each other than with other individuals. They tend to interact more frequently. And they show more imitation than, than among people with weaker ties. Weak ties are still important because they allow new ideas, innovations, and behaviors to transmit across the network. So that they're important to the scale or the viral contagion that you can get in social networks. And then there's Christakis and Fowler's work, which I think is really elegant. They work both on hunter-gatherers in Tanzania and uh, in the medical arena with behaviors like obesity and uh, drinking, showing over and over again that we are statistically influenced, not just by our friends, but three degrees out by friends of friends of friends. So people we don't even know. And I think when you get the friends of friends of friends, it goes down to about 6% six, six or something. So adding social networking to our evolutionary models can give them power. And <clears throat> what that means is that we have this increased potential for um, social contagion, and especially if you add leadership to that, because leaders emerge in social networks, the social networks themselves provide new opportunities for cooperation. Another evolutionary model I want to talk about is the, the boarded, bordered nested tug of war model of Kern Reeve and Bert Holdobler, which suggests that if we can arrange for some of the subgroups within a population to be competing with each other, we can the overall level of cooperation. And this is something that really has some practical implications. We know a little bit about this group identity and, and competition leading to increased cooperation and the mechanisms that govern that. Um, we do see in team sports, for example, a high level of group identity and outgroup antagonism. We also see winning team members and their spectators, if they're male, showing increased testosterone levels. So there's a, a real connection between winning and how, how we feel and, how, and our, our endocrinology. And there, we have a whole wide range of cooperative and competitive emotions. So what we're thinking of doing prescriptively with Yardmap is generating, is, is launching challenges for people to get 20 different contiguous properties to map their spaces and then enter a contest once they've done that uh, for a prize. And the prize that we're considering right now is, is through a grant with Josh Sarah in landscape architecture where that neighborhood would get a complete environmental design, the winning neighborhood. But you've got all the other competitors looking at that, so there's this great potential for studying whether or not those there's imitation at the group level. So in addition to these sort of evolutionarily derived hypotheses, I want to, I want to talk about the proximate mechanisms that we want to uh, support in, in yard maps. So we're basically taking human behavior into account and developing the tool that's going to support our pro-social tendencies. We know from a whole breadth of research that education alone really <coughs> doesn't do much to change behavior. There are a bunch of studies, even just in the environmental context, involving litter, energy efficiency, 
water conservation, and then there's this meta, there's this meta analysis by Finger in 1994, suggesting that that um, there's no general environmental attitude behavior connection, <coughs> and that's actually the low hanging fruit for me. It's a mystery. It's mystified me for some time why people who have even very strong environmental attitudes fail to change their behaviors. It's an incredibly hard to thing to do and there are lots and lots of reasons and the only thing we're, we're really exploring here is the social reasons why. So we'll start with the theory of reasoned action which was uh, which was first to really take into consideration the importance of social norms and the injunctive social norm is basically what's acceptable or not acceptable the subjective norm is the perceived social pressure to engage or not engage in a behavior. So it has to do with whether you're feeling approved of or disapproved of. And we all know that social norms violations can be quite jarring. We have a visceral response to some of them. And that norms, especially the norm of reciprocity, can be quite costly. <laughs> C. Aldini was, I think, the pioneer in actually recognizing that maybe you could use descriptive social norms to help facilitate behavioral change. So what is a, a descriptive social norm? It's the perception of what's commonly done in the situation. So it's a proxy for a subjective social norm. And by making norms salient, he could influence the, the level of cooperation in environmental contexts. And the, I think, most well-known study of that is the hotel towel study, where we're still seeing tons of environmental messages in hotel rooms saying, save energy, save water, reuse your towel. They basically don't work very well. And it's surprising that anybody's still using it. Because what, what they showed a long time ago is that what works a lot better is saying, other people in this hotel reuse their towels. And what worked even better than that was other people who stayed in this room, people you don't even know, who stayed in this room used their towels. That caused another big jump in hotel towel reuse. The problem with the descriptive norms is there's a boomerang effect. So if it's a quantitative measure you're after, something like energy redu use reduction, people are as likely to go up towards the social norm as down. And so Cialdini's group, his students and postdocs and people who are now fa have faculty positions from his lab, have been playing with things like, in this case, um, adding the subjective social norm to the prescriptive social norm. So this is an energy use study. And as you can see, you are fantastic. You're hardly using any energy at all. Your efficient neighbors are using more, and all neighbors are using even more. But what keeps you there, what keeps you there is this. And they did a study and they showed both in the short term and in the long term, just adding those subjective social norms was effective. I want to bring in a second issue that I think is related, and this has to do with what Bob Frank has been talking about in past years, he didn't talk about this in his most recent seminar, I don't think, but um, is, is that social status is relative, and we do this sort of comparative ratcheting up. So what he discovered is that people would rather live in a 3,000 square foot house in a house with mostly 2,000 square foot houses than to live in a 4,000 square foot house, a more expensive, better house, in a 6,000 square foot neighborhood. And we see a lot of this sort of status advertisement signal in research on conspicuous conservation. So <clears throat> in California, green certified homes sell for more than non-green certified homes. But if you're in a Prius neighborhood where your, your, your neighbors are going to think a lot about this, they sell for even more. And also in California, they found, Sexton and Sexton at Berkeley have found that people will put their solar roof panels on the, sh on the shady side of their house 
if that's the side of the house that faces the road where people can see it. Amazing. Who would think of that? So what are we going to do in the yard map? We can take this, this information, this empirical research, and the ideas, and see within yard map whether these kinds of things also matter. So we can use a combination of benchmarks and social norms. Here's the average we're pointing to. I don't know if this is the exact design we'll end up with. But you know, you would get the ordinarily get the boomerang effect, but maybe if you add the subjective social norm, you can actually cause and also some other rewards, you can cause people to move up and actually shift the social norm upwards. So those are the kinds of uh, things that we can do with pictures in yard map um, to try to promote cooperation in a social network. The theory of planned behavior, which, which supplanted the theory of reason to action, added perceived behavioral control, or I would call that a sense of efficacy, to the equation. And so we wanted to know whether um, increasing the perception of behavioral control would increase people's interest and intentions in adopting conservation behaviors. And there are really two pieces of that. One is you want to you want to avoid disempowering and fear-based messages. And that's well known from the communication literature. But the other thing is you kind of want to provide a sense of efficacy. So we did an experiment. We took 3,000, roughly 3,000 citizen scientists who agreed to participate in a survey and we asked whether making group efficacy salient would increase their interest in adopting energy conservation behaviors. The, act, the exact question that we asked was how interested would you be in working to reduce your carbon footprint and being able to choose the yard map to display your results? And we used a Riker scale, and that's what you see on the y-axis here. The experiment involved randomly allocating people to a control and, or one of four experimental treatments. And the experimental treatments are divided. On the left, you see the, uh, we're testing the fear-based message piece. On the right, we're actually testing um, efficacy messages. So essentially, right before we ask them this question for the control, we kind of reframe the question as a statement. So there was no framing, no new framing going on. But for danger to humans, we preface the question with climate change is danger, dangerous to humans. How interested would you be on and on that? And then we thought, <coughs> maybe fear is really about us. And if we change the object of fear, if we change it to birds, something we know our audience cares about, will we get a different result? So we said climate change is dangerous to birds. And then we asked them that question. Then we, for the, group, for the right half of this figure, we looked at group efficacy. So we gave them a statement that said if everybody, if, if a large number of people work together, it could have a significant impact on the national carbon footprint. How interested would you be? <laughs> And then the only difference for that last one is that we said for future generations at the end. So uh, could have an impact for future generations. What we found is that when we looked at danger to humans, there's no statistical difference relative to the control. There's a highly significant difference with danger to, danger to birds, and it's also different from danger to humans. We also saw a significant increase in interest with group efficacy and group efficacy plus future generations. And so this suggests that there are ways to, de to deliver dire messages about climate change to people, um, but they probably aren't going to involve us as the objects. And there's a lot of research that can be done on that, um, including looking at neogenic objects, talking about uh, yeah, talking about kin, things like that. Um, <clears throat> and then it also shows that group efficacy is fairly effective. And this is just what the the uh, general the results of the generalized linear model look like. In addition to the framing statement, we we controlled for whether people were a skeptic or not. Um, we we asked whether they had prior experience with citizen science. 
and we looked, we used age as a covariate, thinking that there could be differences with age. We also include the frame by skeptic interaction. So <clears throat> last spring while I was on sabbatical and putting a lot of these ideas together, I formed a rapid response fund team that was really largely interested in human cooperation. And that team includes the project leader, Rhiannon Crane, Jeff Hancock, who works on deception online, Poppy McLeod, who works on intro group dynamics, Kern Reeve, who models cooperation, and Connie Yuan, who studies social networking. Incidentally, three of these people are from the communication department, but there's a, a number of social psychologists in communications. And what we wanted to study really is the reputational mechanisms, which I think of as the glue for um, cooperation. So the idea that we are watching what each other is doing and that our level of cooperation can be very much take, uh, influenced by other people's level of cooperation. And we have very refined cheater detection systems we know from evolutionary psychologists like Cosmides and many people who've studied this after her. Um, <coughs> and we, <coughs> according to Fetchenhauer's work, this is really interesting to me, we have the ability based on a video to identify permanent altruistic traits in others with 20 seconds of viewing. That's how good we are at it. That doesn't mean we can always detect cheaters because, you know, it's an arms race, right? But it means we're pretty good at it. So the kinds of design features that we're adding to yard map are scores of all overall assessment. And this really goes to um, the indirect reciprocity studies that really focus on image scoring. And so if we can provide an easy visual score for people, they can assess each other's level of cooperation. And that's something we can also, with permission, manipulate. <coughs> we are really interested in investigating the importance of people's sense of being observed on their level of cooperation in a social network. So. Um, the hypothesis here is that pro-environmental behavior increases with both observer number, in this case the number of followers, and the sense of being observed, which we're representing with a picture of eyes. So our prediction then is that experimentally doubling the number of followers for a subset of people would increase their activity, their sustainable activity in yard map, which we can track because, of course, everything they're doing in their map is stored as data. Placing eye spots next to the number of followers should also increase pro-environmental behavior. And this is actually based on a really cool study done in 19, in, I'm sorry, in 2006 by Bateson et al. in a university coffee room where they, everybody was supposed to contribute to purchasing the coffee and you're supposed to put money in a cup. We all know what it's like when you get there and you want your coffee. And so, um, uh, but I always go back to my office because I'm concerned about my reputation. Um, but, but so what, what they did was they put eye spots right next to the cup, or not eye spots, a picture of eyes. And then alternate weeks, they put a picture of flowers. And what they saw was in alternate weeks, when they had the eyes, the donations went up, and they had the flowers, they lose for like six or eight weeks, the donations went down, up and down, and up and down. And so we're, we're wondering whether this is something that can work online to support cooperation. <laughs> it's one of my favorite studies. Um, we're, we're also asking whether sort of self-comparison with others can influence cooperation. It's nice because there are lots of little empty spaces to fill in. Um, and we want to test, again, these social norms hypotheses, uh, whether adding levels or comparative benchmarks to social norms, comparisons increases pro-environmental behavior, and also, whether making the subjective norm in addition to the prescriptive norm salient will increase cooperation. So essentially, we'd be placing icons like smiley faces and stars and to see if we can really avoid the boomerang effect. And I think most importantly, and perhaps least well-developed at this point, is that we have the capacity to, to track social networks, track people's connections to each other, their frequency of connection representing tie strength, um, and, and really look at social networking 
effects. So look at emergence of leadership within the social network and um, observationally and look at social contagion as it occurs naturally, but then also do experiments where we literally plant ideas with leaders and look at their diffusion through the network or seed the network with new ideas or behaviors. And these kinds of experiments have been conducted in Yahoo research and, and uh, I find them really interesting. And the, I think one thing that will facilitate diffusion diffusion of behaviors is the availability of little icons that are really obvious in terms of what behavior they represent and the visibility of those icons as reputational indicators. So we can actually pick, we can add a new icon and new behavior and study the diffusion of that even though the project is ongoing. I just want to end by saying that uh, as Steve and I were talking, or I should say arguing in a fun way about before I, I started this talk, I'm not a believer that there's a single solution um, to environmental issues. I'm a believer that, and, and I guess I would say that Eleanor Ostrom and other, others have suggested that top-down regulation actually interferes with uh, collective action, and some of the models do show that. But I think we should be trying at all levels. And I, I was really happy to see that the United Kingdom is considering all levels of, of regulation and cooperation as important to meeting their 2050 energy use reduction or, or carbon footprint reduction goals. And they actually have an entire report on behavior change which relies on some of these psychologically based social marketing techniques. And I guess um, you know what I'd say is that uh, I'd be very interested in hearing your comments. This is new research for me. I'm happy to hear people's ideas and also happy to continue to engage in the dialogue that Stephen and I started of, you know, really we're approaching this from so many different angles and how should we be thinking about integrating across these levels in terms of how what we're doing at one level can influence what's happening at another level, either in a positive way or also possibly in Thank you very much. So let me just start by saying, thanks very much, Janice. I think it's great that the energy and the creativity and the rigor and the collaborative spirit that you bring to that work is really terrific. And it's really great to see. I would say, in the spirit of this friendly exchange, that for me, the House of Lords report is the bad news. Really? It's all about the individual and behavior change because they're unwilling to impose taxes. They're not going to ration. That so that's just one little sub-report, right? Mm -hmm. And then they have all these other... When I, I, I read through the other report, there were some fairly stringent... So for the, the, Cameron, the Cameron government in the UK yeah. closed down the Sustainable Development Commission. So this is what we were talking about before. For me... No, no, the, the policy environment is one where the only thing on the table is education and individual behavior change and social marketing because the other tools like regulation, taxation, are off the table. This must be recent because I was talking to John Krebs just a month ago and he didn't say anything about that. To him, this was a tiny piece of what they were doing. So it, it's not the important point. Um, the important is to take some questions, and I think I agree with <laughs> the spirit of your last comment. Okay. Yes. Um, so I am not going to pretend to understand what motivated people to play Farmville, but there's a very different. Um, yeah, so the person sitting down to play Farmville is doing some kind of like mindless moving stuff around, and the person who's engaging um, in anything, you know, anything else has to you know, map out their yard and be very specific and thoughtful about. Um, you know, what their plans are and maybe educate themselves about how they can help bird habitat. So do you understand anything about the populations of people who you are drawing into your work um, versus the potential to actually get other people to, to think a little bit more thoughtfully about them? Okay, time? so there's so many things embedded in what you just say, so I'm going to try to pick them apart. So the first thing is, farm, is Farmville very different? Is, the, is it lower investment? That's very true. And any citizens in our analysis of our citizen science projects, it's really obvious that the more you ask people to do, the fewer people will do it. 
um, what we're hoping with the art map is that because it's user generated, it'll have a little bit more traction in getting people to do more, more people to do more. So the second thing you asked about was well, you know, if we understand enough about the populations to yeah, think about ways to get people who are willing to play Farmville to play something that's actually a little bit more educational or interactive and meaningful way to play with society. Yeah, so what, what I'm interested in is kind of the low-hanging fruit, the idea that even people with strong environmental attitudes have a great deal of difficulty making that shift to actually expressing their attitudes and their values as behavior. It's incredibly hard, I think, for every one of us. And so I think that's the arena that we're working with initially with the art map. But because it is socially networked and because it's being pushed out through Facebook, it's possible that we could bring in people who, I don't know who the Farmville population is, I can't claim to know, but bring in people from other, with other um, attitudes and ideas and that they could be within Yard Map. What we haven't seen yet in Yard Map is flaming at all in the social network. Now the social network is currently very tiny. We only see supportive com uh, comments. And so it's very possible that Yard Map's only going to be drawing in the people who have an authentic interest in making a difference. But even if we can provide support for those people, that will be significant, I think. Not not in terms of the scale we we would like to achieve, but it's it's a, it's a significant step forward in learning how to do just that. Did that answer your question? Okay. Rich? Yeah, Janice, um, sort of in the spirit of, of what Steve raised, I mean, I think part of the reason that there's lousy prediction of, of environmental behaviors from environmental attitudes is this huge influence of social structure, right? I mean, so, you know, for example, when I Wait, lived can in... can you define social structure? Because I'm, I'm thinking network the structure. The systems of norms, regulations, institutional influences that enable some behaviors and constrain others. I mean, so for example, when I lived in State College, Pennsylvania, I didn't recycle cereal boxes. Now I live here in Ithaca and I recycle cereal boxes. It wasn't that my attitude towards it changed, but the damn recyclers would not take them in State College, and right. I do take them here. And so there's just... there. You know, in terms of, for example, thinking about perceived behavioral control, I mean, you're working a lot sort of on the edge of how to increase people's perceptions that they can control their behavior. There is that other side of the equation that's very, very big in terms of actual behavioral control and how our behaviors are governed. So, for example, there's two elements to that, right? There's the, can I do what I want? And will doing what I want to do make a difference? So there's those two elements right. to, to efficacy that both need to be considered. And a number of you know Ann, Ann Armstrong, my master's student, who's recently, recently left, but she found a huge effect, for example, um, in looking at riparian landowners' willingness to, and residential landowners' willingness to engage in riparian pr protective kinds of behaviors that depended totally on whether they, you know, thought that what they did would make any difference. If there was a dairy farm 100 yards downstream of them, they were incredibly less likely to engage in forms of you know, riparian buffer plantings and management, et cetera, et cetera. And so I guess I would just urge, too, that you take the, the structural element of it in terms of you know, what are the local carrots and sticks, basically, that are going to affect people's behaviors as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think there are, I mean, there's, there's money. There, I mean, there are all kinds of barriers to enacting behaviors, but at and the level sense. that you're talking, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but at the level that you're talking about, um, I, I think we can address a sense of group efficacy by actually showing quantitatively how people's behaviors add together. We haven't really tackled that yet, have we, Chris? The, the sort of. <laughs> I mean, with, with the application, we haven't tackled any, any mechanism yet for, for showing how people's behaviors add up. But we can't, yeah, you know. Yeah, that's, that's on deck now. That's on deck now. Yeah. Well, that could be a really powerful tool for actually addressing that component of efficacy, right? I mean, if, right. if you see that there are others in your neighborhood who are engaging in certain activities, then that can, that can help lead towards the contagion that you're, right. that you're looking for. And if we can literally add up how many people are and what that what that would mean quantitatively compared to 
yeah, so basically showing progress. I think that'd be really important. But we can't do much about the structures. No. Um, except, in, you know, as Steve and I were talking about, that people do ultimately influence those structures. Exactly. And they may need social support to do that. <coughs> yes, Shorna. Um, thank you for your, for your seminar. That was really interesting. And I think um, your research has the potential to make a contribution, um, in particular looking at sort of the next iteration of Ajahn's uh, theory of plan behavior, which is now the reason action approach, and they further theorize that behavior is influenced by attitudes, norms, and perceived behavioral control, as well as beliefs about all of those, and, and what they call background factors, which they throw out there, sort of getting a little bit at some of the, the structural things that Stephen and Rich brought up, um, but there's, there's um, I think re researchers are just now starting to really look at both these individual level factors within that so social psychological framework and the structural. And so it would be uh, really interesting to think about what um, what kinds of social uh, structural variables you might um, be able to investigate. I mean, there's, you know, the size of their land, for example, might like they'll play a role if they have a large, you know, parcel of land or a smaller parcel of land, is it wooded, is it not wooded? Um, and, and sort of taking into account the context, which I think could really play a role in that social network, and it looks like you're perhaps investigating that with um, sort of having a neighborhood level project that, that might come out of um, this, this network. So um, I was wondering if you were perhaps, are you modeling any of those kind of factors as well? The so um, we haven't gotten there yet, but because the project isn't really launched. But what I hear you saying is that, you know, say in surveys, we could account for some other important predictors of behavior that maybe aren't measured in yard map, but that also in yard map, we are measuring some factors and will have in the data database some factors that could influence behavior. What we don't know yet, and I think an interesting question is whether your immediate neighbors are as important as the people maybe who, who might be more distant but with whom you're connected through strong ties. And I think there's, you should be able to differentiate between spatial closeness and actual tie strength and things like that. But, um, but that's a great thought because we haven't even begun to think about what other things we want to put to find out more about the social landscape, whether it's within the network or geographically, that could be important to outcomes. So um, Matt? <laughs> Really interesting talk. Um, I'm very intrigued by the ability that this tool can give you to go from survey approach to um, sort of experiments and control experiments. And but I'm curious, um, do you ask for a blanket permission, or do you have to get permissions more specific to each experiment? And so, is there a possibility of sort of backlash in terms of um, behavioral engineering and the perception that oh, bird map, don't go there. That's you know. They're just trying to change your behavior. Yeah, I mean, I think there is there is the possibility that people would, you know, the participants, fully informed participants, and you know, since the research is all out on the web and, and that sort of thing, ultimately, right, are are going to not be happy about yard map. As far as social engineering, what we're trying to do is create the structures that occur in ordinary society that are depauperate in the web. And so I, you know, I think in a way it is calculated, but I don't see it necessarily as, you know, it's a, I, I've worried about that and I haven't decided about it, but I think well, it can help to sort of try to, to build it with attention to how people work rather than a particular precise goal. Yeah, I wonder whether, you know, um, rather than making go to the literature to find the results, it might actually um, interest people to see the quantification of group behavior. Yeah. Right? And, and that would be the straightforward way of, of dealing with the results once we have them. Yeah. I like that. Thank you. Allow me to suggest that since Janice is a colleague and we see lots of her, you'll have a chance to ask her questions. At 1 o'clock, I want to close. But I want to ask why not go beyond putting the uh, pictures of the eye on the coffee can? and just put everyone under surveillance cameras. <laughs> <laughs>